Kukos, the almighty chickens of the Zelda universe. If you accidentally shed their blood, they will in turn completely drain you of yours. I promise, this is one of the worst ways to go. Just trust me on that and don't ask how I know. The beauty of these divine creatures is that in Breath of the Wild, Link isn't the only character that needs to watch out for them. Because enemies can be hurt by Kukos, and even targeted by them. So this of course begs the question, if Kukos can hurt enemies, can we stop Calamity Ganon with their power? It's going to be a long and stressful journey, but let's find out. Now you might be thinking, why try to kill Calamity Ganon with this extremely unorthodox method? And my answer for that is, because it's entertaining? Because it's mind-numbing to do? I mean, this is YouTube after all. Let me suffer for your entertainment, man. I killed Ganondorf only using clay pots and Ocarina of Time, and I defeated Bongo Bongo by only slapping the rump of a horse. I turned the floor of Mario 64 into killer pianos, just to fight Bowser in an impossible battle. Kukos are a natural migration point for old Swanky Box. But before we begin our adventure, you best be learning some pristine Kuko facts, because all of this will be on the quiz. So Kukos can be found in various areas all around Hyrule, but oftentimes these areas aren't near anything interesting. I don't want a killer bird in a village. I want a killer bird running by my side, wing in hand, as we conquer Hyrule Castle. But even if we bring Kukos to abstract areas, there is a chance they won't function properly. Take Gerudo Town for example. It takes four hits to activate the Chicken Sky Blender, and those four hits are logged consecutively. Meaning, I could hit this thing three times, walk away, and come back for a fourth and it will get angry. While it is angry, its attack will follow me into safe zones. So for example, the entire Gerudo Town is technically safe and enemies are non-aggressive here. I bring this up because it's important for later on as lots of interiors are marked as safe. So if I load up this secret shop full of Kukos and give them a good chop, you'll see that nothing happens. We're free to beat our Kuko in public relentlessly with no <laughs> I can't say this without laughing. We're free to beat our Kuko in public relentlessly with no repercussions. This is because the town is negating the attack state of the Kukos, so it never occurs. The same thing happens anywhere within Gerudo Town, and it's something I've talked about in another video. Building interiors out in the world often do this, like the ice house on the edge of the desert. At least according to my experiments they do. Kukos won't try to attack Link regardless of how much damage they take. We can despawn Kukos though by tossing them in water, so that's a thing. Kukos, when they can, will always try to target the last thing that damaged them. But this gets confusing logic-wise if Link is hit with an area attack. So if a random guardian approaches you in the field and punches you with his laser fists, we're going to have a problem. The guardian is doing the attacking, but because Link is the source of the explosion, the Kukos blame him for getting their feathers ruffled. So they beat Link's burnt corpse while he repeatedly gets shot by lasers. But this isn't necessarily a bad thing, because we can always use the Kukos as a weapon ourselves as they're attacking Link. They can give this guardian a run for its money while attacking us too, as each Kuko that makes contact with the enemy deals a whopping 2 damage. Yes, two damage. This is going to take quite a long time. Did I mention Calamity Ganon has 8,000 HP? Okay, now that you're a seasoned Kuko Scholar, let's talk about why we can't just roll up to Ganon's crib, chicken in hand. For one, getting a Kuko to that location would be super difficult. I mean, you have a fortress surrounded by water, the ultimate Kuko destroyer, among it raining lasers and being a brutal trek upwards. But this actually is not the problem. I mean, it's a problem on its own, but it doesn't matter if you make the journey if you can't get your feathered friend where you need to be. And this is where things get dicey. So for starters, if you roll up clutching your bird and enter the sanctum, the cutscenes will start and remove your cuckoo altogether. So now you spawn down below without your travel companion. And even if we turn the sanctum room into a chicken coop, the hole up above doesn't exactly exist the way you think it would. As shown in a previous video, enemies active in this room cannot fall through the floor, and it is merely cosmetic. But our quest for destroying Ganon must not falter. So we're now going to explore some alternative methods. And quite honestly, it was a bit of a process to reach the end result. So for this next process, I actually reached out to Y Kuturu to help me out. They make some pretty slick Breath of the Wild mods, and I was going to need all the help I could get for getting Kukos in unconventional places. Why, you ask? Well, because it's not as simple as just adding Kukos to the area. If we place Kukos around Calamity Ganon, for one, they can fail to load if they aren't correctly implemented once the cutscene ends. And two, having them appear down there successfully does not mean they'll be hostile. They have to have the correct flag set to ensure they stay loaded. But even then, they are non-aggressive. Remember how I talked about building interiors being safe? Well, that applies here, and the Kukos do not activate. So it's actually kind of a pain in the butt, but it's the map's collision that determines whether a Kuko can activate or not. And editing the world's map collision is a bit of a dicey process currently. So the idea was to take the Battle Room's 3D model and recreate new collision just based off that section, while completely deleting the collision of this world map's area. 
This means you fall through the floor anywhere else except for this part. To test if this would work, elevator objects were added to simulate new flooring. And the cuckoos were able to be activated. So now that we knew we could do this, the actual room needed to be redone because Calamity Ganon needed to be able to jump to the walls and walk across the floors without falling. This battle room actually did used to have its own collision set that is referenced but is no longer in the files. So at some point, the developers swapped it out to pull from the world map. So why Kuturu repeat collision to the object and basically made it mirror what normally exists in the game? However, under our rules, the collision would not hinder the ability of the Kukos. Now, there's still one last problem for this, and it's triggering the fight. We need the correct flow of events to happen in-game, otherwise all of this is pointless. However, the entire castle now doesn't have collision, so Link will just fall through the ground and plummet into the great beyond. The Sanctum Room normally contains the trigger for the Calamity Gan fight too, but in order to activate it, Link must be standing still, so that setup won't work. So this entire section of the map in Breath of the Wild is no man's land. So we had to move the trigger for the Ganon fight to the bridge leading to Hyrule Castle. With our fingers crossed, we hoped this far of a distance was still okay for activating the sequence. And it was. The camera angles and data got messed up for the cutscene, but everything worked. And most importantly, it was now Link, Calamity Ganon, and a room full of Kukos. The battle could now finally begin. When the fight started, I immediately ran for the Kuko, swiping like a madman. And I have to say, it was extremely satisfying directing the storm to Calamity Ganon and watching his health go down. But this truthfully is the more ineffective approach. The Kuko swarm is centered around Link, and Link can't stand within Ganon. So this means the swarm is only interacting with certain parts of Ganon. To be a true Kuko warrior, we need Ganon to become the target. The goal is not to hit Calamity Ganon at all with Link. Every point of damage needed to come from the Kukos. So we need to basically arm Kukos by striking them three times and then letting Ganon hit them with a melee attack. Area attacks will make the Kukos attack Link, but if Ganon hits them, oh boy. These chickens are only doing two damage per hit, but Ganon is so large and can take damage on almost any part of his body, so he gets shredded. It may not look like it, but he's taking some pretty substantial damage. Backing off away from Ganon and watching the storm devour him is quite the sight. His animations were all lagging because of the delay the damage causes, and I could run away while the Kukos did all the work. When he got up on the wall, it was way hard to hit Calamity Ganon because most of his attacks count as area damage. Having chickens swarm me meant I'd miss my chance to attack, since he was out of reach. I wouldn't be able to bring the swarm to him. So lots of times I just crouched behind a Kuko and wait for single strike attacks on the wall. It felt so strange fighting Calamity Ganon by not fighting him at all. I was always pretty far away when he was on the walls because the Kukos, if activated correctly, could swarm him from wherever. The whole battle was a big stress test of patience. And then it happened. With one last attack, Calamity Ganon hits his next milestone. The Kukos had unleashed Golden Ganon and their beaks became useless. My strategy would have to change. So in this phase, Ganon is essentially invincible unless you land a flurry strike or deflect a laser back at him. Kukos glaze off his shining brilliance and it sounds really neat. Take a listen yourself. But this whole situation is problematic because I didn't want to hurt Ganon in any way except for the Kukos. But a flurry strike wouldn't give me the flexibility of bringing the swarm and I'd be directly attacking him. So I thought the best course of action was to just deflect his laser back at him. This does damage Ganon slightly, even with his invincibility, but allows him to fall to the floor where we can then activate the swarm on ourselves and then run straight for him. And with this new strategy, Calamity Ganon was defeated by Kukos. A bizarre test for sure, but the fight is only halfway over. So for the great outdoors portion of the fight, we decided that giant Kukos would be best. The increased size would make them easier to hit from far away. Now, the unfortunate part is, Beast Calamity Ganon cannot be hurt by anything other than the Bow of Light. I attempted several times to get him to attack the Kukos, but every time the swarm would come after me. If a Kuko touched Calamity Ganon, they'd essentially be absorbed and would despawn as they faded to nothingness. So getting Calamity Ganon to step on them wasn't an option. When I was carrying my giant Kuko toward Ganon and got hit by the giant energy laser, my Kuko did start spinning out like crazy. It was like a top spinning forever towards the horizon. The only way to save my bird was to shoot it and remind it of its true purpose. So after many failed attempts to try to target Ganon, I decided that I was going to defeat Ganon while Kukos were active. If I couldn't have Kukos attack Ganon, I was going to snipe through a cloud of Kukos to take Ganon down. And that's what I did. Slow motion shot through a sea of birds to hit each target in front of me. It was oddly satisfying. For the last hit, I launched myself into the air, aimed a shot at my pre-damaged Kuko, activating the mob, and then sent one final arrow out to destroy Ganon. And it felt glorious. So yes, Calamity Ganon can be defeated by Kukos, 
mostly. But a second form is an entirely different beast. If you enjoyed this silly video, consider liking it because it helps me out a ton. And I'll see you in my next absurd video. Cheers.